Well, it's wonderful. It's good to see Eloy up there playing the bass. What a wonderful song. One of my, it's become one of my favorite songs of just a wonderful modern hymn to behold our God. And that's what we're doing, and let's behold him by, by seeing the glory of his word taught through our Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples, to the multitudes in front of it, and, and by God's providential grace, it is extended to us this morning. So take your Bibles and open it to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. As we're looking at the pathology of human corruption, its causes and its effects, and last week we looked at the cause of it by Jesus' teaching to the multitude and then even having to explain and clarify for and, uh, and make that they clarify it for his own disciples. Notice what the text says here in Matthew 15, beginning of verse 10. And after he, he, speaking of Christ, called the multitude to him, he said to them, hear and understand not what enters into the mouth defiles a man, but what proceeds out of the mouth which defiles the man. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this statement? Now, let me just stop right there, just so for those that maybe are coming in in the middle of this, that the reasons why it was, it was significant that the disciples came to him and, and just mentioned to him that the Pharisees were offended. And the Pharisees, as you know, were the spiritual leaders along with the scribes. And the Sadducees were the spiritual leaders of the people of Israel. And the, the Pharisees were particularly the, the, oral, the teachers of the oral law to Israel in, in their time, in their Judaism. And if you go back to verse 1, the Pharisees and the scribes had come to Jesus to try to implicate him with a, with a violation that his disciples had committed, but not a violation of the word of God by a violation of their own traditions that they have elevated to the place of ultimate authority that should only be reserved for the word of God. And it had to do with hand washing. And that because their hands were not washed, if they would eat something, then that would contaminate them, not just uh, and, and they were not thinking about physical hygiene. They were thinking about spiritual hygiene. They were thinking about that, that, that based on Old Testament law, but this is now their interpretation and application of it by their own tradition, that then whatever they eat would make them also spiritually contaminated, unclean, corrupt. And Jesus saw right through their hypocrisy, um, first, because they wanted to implicate him by association of the disciples' quote-unquote guilt of this, their violation of the Pharisees' tradition. And then he sees, the, he sees right through the hypocrisy because they're, tr they're trying to condemn the disciples and Jesus by association because, of their, because he is their teacher for breaking what, what you would think would be God's word or God's law. And Jesus sees right through their hypocrisy by saying, what you're concerned about is your tradition. In fact, if you were so concerned about the word of God, you would not be breaking the fifth commandment, which has to do with honoring your parents with, uh, by, and, and by application of that. And one of the applications of that commandment is that you should be supporting your parents financially in their old age as they need it. But you, find, you have found a way in your traditions to create a loophole that can make you, that can exempt you from doing that and at the same time make you feel like you're still fulfilling God's law. On the contrary, you have invalidated, as Jesus says in verse 6, you have invalidated the word of God for the sake of your tradition. In fact, this is a reflection that, that fulfills or at least reflects what, uh, by, by analogy, what 
the people did centuries ago during the time of Isaiah, you're just like that generation of Jewish people who honor me with your lips, but your heart is far away from me. You honor God with your lips, but your heart is far away from me. So in the end, you're the one that's corrupted. You're corrupt. And Jesus begins to teach them where does corruption begin? Where does it originate? So, of course, when he says that that which enters the mouth defiles the man, but what proceeds, it's not what enters the mouth what defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. This is why the disciples observed and pointed out to Jesus that the Pharisees were hearing this because, again, this is a knock on them. This is, this is Jesus now coming back and condemning them well, let me put it this way, correcting them and by correction condemning them for their actual corruption. They have it all wrong. They have it all backwards. It's not what you ingest. It's what comes out. It's what pro projects out of you that shows that you are corrupted. So then, he's, then he uses two images as to where the Pharisees are wrong and why they are, uh, why they are under God's condemnation. They're like a, an unwanted uh, a plant, one that has grown and has taken root, but is unwanted by he the Heavenly Father. And so it's a plant that he did not plant. And so in, they need to be rooted up. They shall be rooted up. And second... They're blind guides of the blind. In other words, they're false teachers. They're false teachers. So if you're a spiritually blind person, you don't want for someone to guide you. You don't want another blind person to guide you. Both will fall into the pit, as Jesus illustrates there. And then we find that Peter answered back, explained the parable to us, and he said, are you lacking un in understanding? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? In other words, that doesn't actually spiritually contaminate you. Uh, all it does is that it'll just go through the, the, the natural biological processes and it'll just be eliminated out. It'll be out of you. It'll be just excrement but it does not corrupt you. And then in verses 18 through 20, he begins to talk about the effects, not just the origin of human corruption, but the effects of it. The, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Sometime uh, when we began looking at this passage in chapter 15, I shared a transcript of a, basically of a, of a forum uh, held by, I guess you could call it social cultural analysts. The one that was moderating it was Jordan Peterson, who's become, uh, who's a, a, a uh, a, psycholo a Canadian psychologist who's become now well known through his books and his lectures on morality and human behavior. And then he had Dennis Prager, who is uh, a Jewish man who's conservative in his values, uh, in terms of moral values. Well, we found that Dennis Prager, in the end, talked about how corruption is not on the inside, but corruption is on the outside, and that Judaism does not teach, basically, that what goes on on the inside corrupts you. Well, let me just give you an, an, another portion of, of, of their discussion here. So this is another part of the transcript. Jordan Peterson tells, asks Dennis Prager, well, what's the stance on pornography just to put you on the spot. Dennis Prager answers, you did indeed. Um, okay, so my answer, when it's raised on my radio show, I have a male-female hour, and I'm very open about sexual subjects. I always ask if a wife calls me and says my husband looks at pornography I found on his computer. I have one question. 
How is your life of intimacy with your husband? Is it good? In other words, is the pornography in lieu of you or in addition to you? And I know this is not a religious answer, and I'm not even giving a religious answer. I'm giving what I think is a moral and realistic answer. Men want vi variety, and uh, if adultery is a substitute for it, if pornography is a substitute for one's wife, it's awful. If it's a substitute for adultery, it's not awful. That is my thoughts. There isn't predictable here. I mean, again, this is, Dennis Prager just shows that no matter how conservative his moral values are, he's a blind guide. He has no clue to the real significance of the law of God, whether it be the, the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery, and how that begins in the heart with just lusting after a woman or lusting after a man that is not your husband or your wife. Or the 10th commandment that you shall not covet. And you shall not covet any person's possessions. You shall not want something that doesn't belong to you that God has not graciously given to you. So the question even from out of this and out of what we've learned so far from Jesus' teaching Let's answer the question, can I look at pornography, if corruption comes from the outside, can I look at pornography, for instance, and not corrupt me? May it never be, just to use Paul's language. May it never be. On the contrary, what we have seen already from Jesus' teaching, what we see in Scripture, is that pornography is then... a an output of the corruption that is in your heart. If you would want to see filth, then that means that your heart is already filthy. Jesus' point is, is that those things that are spiritually neutral, whether you're listening to something that's spiritually neutral in terms of uh, musical sounds or whether the things now that, such as ink on your body, or food that you ingest, that's not what actually corrupts you. What corrupts, what, what the corruption is already in your heart, the sin that you're entertaining in your heart and that you desire to fulfill in your heart, and that, that then comes out outwardly. So what we find here now in verses 18 through 20 is Jesus now as he gave the origin or the cause of human corruption and the pathology of corruption that affects not only man's spiritual nature, but then because of that effect, it, it, it affects and it impedes, it obstructs his worship of God because God is not going to accept worship that is corrupt. Now he gives in verses 18 through 20 the effects of it. It contains the capstone of Jesus' teaching. What comes out of a man is that which defiles a man. Every person has spiritual heart disease. Man's spiritual heart disease was regularly confirmed by Jesus. And just as a reminder, we saw that in Matthew chapter 12, after we find that the Pharisees accuse him of being demon, basically demon-possessed or empowered by the devil... He then says in, in, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34, you brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills or characterizes the heart. The good man out of his good treasure, the treasure here is his heart, brings forth what is good. The evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what is evil. So what is brought forth is coming from where? From the inside. Now you may raise the you may raise the question. Well, doesn't the Bible say, for example, in First Corinthians fifteen, bad company corrupts good morals? That seems like it's corruption coming from the outside. Of course, we even have the advice that that the inspired counsel of Solomon to his to his uh, to his son to not hang out or or run around with. Um, with thieves and murderous, violent people? I mean, doesn't that seem to maybe 
go against or contradict what Jesus is saying uh, here in terms of where does corruption come from? No, not at all. The Bible and Jesus is not teaching against corrupting influences. Meaning influences that tempt the heart to then accept and want to then entertain and practice and desire sin, evil, wickedness, filthiness. And so there can be what? Tempting influences that corrupt that bring corruption or corrupting influences, but with a heart that's already vulnerable to that. That's why later in, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, guard your heart, because out of it comes forth the wellspring or the issues of life. It is a fountainhead of life. And again, if you're hanging out with people that, that want to do sinful things and, and, you know, whether violence or whether they want to steal or they want to tempt you to love money and to, and to believe that that should be an utmost priority or to perhaps look upon women or men or look upon people lustfully outside of the bounds of marriage, those are temptations already to a heart that has what? that has indwelling sin, that has indwelling sin, that already has sinful desires. There's already a vulnerability there. So notice here in chapter 15, and Jesus teaches this, this in Mark chapter 7, that he says here in verse 18, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. Definite article there should be considered as generic, meaning mankind without exception. He's not just talking about a particular specific person or kind of person. He's speaking of this generally or universally. Mankind or defiles the man, meaning mankind without exception. So Jesus is not referring to one kind of man, but to all men in general. And so he then explains where, it, again, the real source of defilement in verse 19, because what, this is what defiles the man. It's not what comes, goes into the man, but what comes out from the heart and proceeds, let's say, in this illustration, in this situation, through his mouth, he explains then that out of the heart, again, the emphasis is source. Jesus is not vague about this. He uses a preposition here that clearly refer, refers to source. It is from the inside where men's hearts um, uh, arise evil schemes. It is out of the heart that sin, which is identified here as in the person, as in the heart of a person. That's the source. Mark, uh, Mark cites uh, Jesus' teaching here, and, and he includes a prepositional phrase that, um, there from Jesus' teaching that says, from just so that, that emphasizes even more. Where is the source from of corruption? From within, in Mark chapter 7, verse 21. And so that removes any doubt and emphasizes the location of the source of defilement. So the significance of heart, as we have already known and, and, and have seen already in Scripture, particularly here in the Gospel, is uh, is grounded in what has already been taught and the disciples would know this they should know this that this is referring to the mission control center of the person in its in his thinking in his affections aspirations decisions emotions jesus stresses that out of this source the heart springs the fountainhead What's the fountainhead? Notice there in verse 19. 
overcome evil thoughts of all sorts of sinful behavior, perverted behavior. This is illustrated by the manifestation of sins listed by Jesus in the rest of the verse, in verse 19. So from out of the heart come evil thoughts. And then he says, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. I mean, you see the connection here. We saw it in the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus had already corrected the oral teaching, the erroneous uh, oral teaching of the Pharisees when they were just limiting the sins or the violations of, of the Ten Commandments to just the outside, outside action. Sin is only done on the outside, like Dennis Prager believes. You know, that, this is not something that you're going to find on Prager University on YouTube. You have heard that it was said, thou shalt not murder, but I say it unto you, the one who what? Who calls his brother a fool, who slanders his brother. In other words, that which you think about your brother, if you have hate for your brother, you already are, you have already violated the sixth commandment because the outward action of murder is, the, is really the, the fruit, or you could say the tree, that has sprung out of the seed of hatred. Or if you lust after a woman that is not your wife. And you can add husband, whoever, that is not your spouse. Again, you have heard it was said, thou shalt not commit adultery, but anyone who lusts, who looks upon a woman to lust after her, Again, the source is what? The evil thought and the desire that is there, which then the act of adultery or the act of fornication then is really the symptom. It's the manifestation of already that underlying corruption. And of course, if we talk about thefts, then we're talking about thou shalt not commit, thou shalt not covet, which is totally an interior sin which then gets what manifested by thefts or materialism and of course lying or slandering other people so at the head of the list here is evil thoughts reasoning devices schemes in the mind the evil thoughts stand behind the evil actions of the people so you commit an evil action well, you know that there's an issue with your heart then. Particularly if, it, if it's habitual. That means that habitually this is characterizing your nature, your heart. This is what preoccupies your mind. This is what you're inclined or tending to do. You see that in other people just realize that it's not just the outward action that makes it bad. Just realize that their outward action is a symptom of what's going on on the inside. So don't just be concerned with what people do on the outside. Be concerned with the state of their heart, with the state of their mind. Actions don't happen like combu spontaneous combustion. Haven't you heard that when someone is caught in something or I, I just made a mistake. I couldn't help myself. Really? Why did you do that? I don't know. Really? You didn't know. There was no thought behind that. Not even a fleeting one. The corruption then, if that's your answer, if that's how you deal with, sin, with confrontation of your sin, particularly from the Word of God or for someone who's using the Word of God in your life, then the corruption is even deeper, more profound than, than you even believe because you're so self-deceived that you can't even figure out supposedly why you sinned. Usually when people say, I don't know, it's not a valid answer, first of all. You're still culpable. And then second, you're really probably being evasive from the confrontation. But God knows your heart. You can't evade God any more than the Pharisees could evade Jesus' inspection of their lives. 
There's always a thought and a motive behind your actions, even if it's fast acting. The word here for thoughts is the Greek word for dialoguing here. What this means is that a person frequently carries on a dialogue in his or her mind. Some people take that conversation with themselves and verbalize them out loud. When we see a person do that, we might say, he's a little cuckoo. He's talking to himself. But you know what? You talk to yourself too. And when I was a kid, oftentimes I found myself alone at home. Friends aren't available to play around. My brothers weren't available. Nobody's available after school. A lot of times I played, with, I, I, I played by myself and I would even talk to myself. So I guess I was a little cuckoo too when I was a kid. But people are not really cuckoo. They're not. They're dialoguing with themselves. And who knows, maybe they're dialoguing with a demon inside of them. If they're unbelievers. Some people like to identify their own thoughts as someone else's voice, but it's not. It's their voice. It's the sinful asp aspect of themselves. And if you're a Christian, then that, then that might be the voice that is saying to the, sp to the Spirit of God as, as it's revealed in your word, I don't want to do that. I know that. I know I ought to do that, but I don't want to do that. Or I, I know that I ought not to do that, but I still want to do it. And it's that battle, that struggle within your heart that needs to be resolved by the choice, the obedient choice of faith that says, I won't choose selfishness here, self-centeredness. I will choose the leading of the Spirit through His Word. And that's how you deal with spiritual struggles on a habitual basis. The people who keep on choosing to sin are people who are not really struggling because in the end, the way that they resolve their so-called struggle is always to choose sin. That's not a struggle. Sinning is winning out. Your selfishness is winning out. So it may be your conscience that you're dialoguing with, but in the end, it's a dialogue, if you're a Christian, between the, the, the desires of the self to conform to the word of God versus the desires of the self that are, that are rebellious still, that still, those desires that still indwell us. Either way, a person thinks to himself, talks to himself with their thoughts. There's an inner reasoning going on there. Consider two opposite examples of talking to oneself. Like in Psalm 14, verse 1. This is a bad deliberation. When the fool says in his heart, there is no what? God. When a man says to himself, there is no God, he's a fool. There's good deliberation. Bless, bless the Lord. There's the, the command. You're telling yourself, bless the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me. You're telling yourself, you know what, let's praise him. In the hearts of unconverted people, the deliberation, the inner reasonings or devisings are definitely of a sinful nature. And of a rebellious nature at the heart of it. So then when a, what a person says within his or her heart is tremendously important. Probably more important than what she or she, uh, he or she says audibly. For example, in Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinks with himself, so he is. He says to you, eat and drink, but his heart is not with you. You know why? Because the verse before that tells you that this is a kind of person who's trying to deceive you into some sort of scheme. One of the reasons why such inner dialogues are so important is that they stimulate inner drives. Like we find in James chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one of you is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. 
then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. See, when lust is conceived, it brings forth death. It gives rise to actions. They also reveal themselves in spoken words. Have you ever found yourself rationalizing sin? Of course you have. Of course. Right? Hey, no one is looking. No one is looking. You won't be caught. Or you know what? Let me just indulge one more time. It's just a little. It won't, it won't hurt. It's not going to hurt anyone. How about this one? I deserve happiness. You know what? Now it's, it, it becomes resentful in the thoughts, right? You start rationalizing. You know, why does everybody else have to? have it good and I don't. God wants me to be happy. I can't hang out without being, I can't hang out without being influenced. I can't, I can look. Have you ever heard this, man? Hey, what's wrong with looking? I can look. Really? But not lust? Lust? Or, hey, there's, where, where's the harm in just looking? Well, Jesus has taught you where the harm is. You'll be lusting. That's why you're looking. The heart is corrupt. Life is hard. You know what? Let me just do this. And you know what? I'm going to rely on God's grace. God, God will forgive. It's okay. God is full of mercy. No one will be affected. Or you know what? I can get close as possible, but in the end, I don't really desire it. I'm not really going to become vulnerable, so I'm just going to get to the edge as close as possible. That's okay. I mean, just fill in whatever you've said to yourself to rationalize sin in your life. Maybe you've used other people. You blame shift. Maybe you blame your parents. Maybe you blame other Christians. Maybe you blame a, a church that didn't treat you well. Maybe you blame the government. You know, Jesus says, all these evil things proceed from the inside and defiles a man, for it is inside from men's hearts that evil schemes rise. And six sins are listed here as examples of it. Sexual sins, thefts, Murders, adulteries, thefts are deeds of coveting, as I mentioned before. False witness and slanders, which reflect arrogance and folly. Actions that begin with the drive of hatred, sexual lust, greed, and sins of speech, which again comes from the heart of an unloving, hateful heart. Or maybe proud heart because you want to put down other people so you can prop yourself up. All these items are naturally of an evil nature, but they proceed from the inside of a man, is what Jesus says. So Jesus has diagnosed the problem of corruption and has declared that the source of all evil actions by men to be the sinful heart that is in man. He acutely lets us know even what the effects are. And that there is no heart in which this evil had, f had failed to take root in, if there is evil there. In John chapter 2, as we finish our time this morning, in John chapter 2, verses 23 and 25, listen to Jesus again, the one who is the heart knower of people. He can read your heart. In John chapter 2, after he was doing many miracles there in his first visit to Jerusalem, once his ministry started. So this is early, at the very early onset of his ministry. It says that when there, and when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, beholding his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man for he himself knew what was in man so he knew that in the end in the heart of those people that were professing faith in him it was not genuine Jesus knows that he can read that even if no one else can, 
cannot. So the heart, as J.C. Rowell puts it, the heart is the main thing with our relationship with God. It must be the main point of all our relationships, especially with God. Love God with all your heart. And God hates a heart that devises evil schemes, right? That plans for evil things. So what is the first thing we need to become? A Christian in order to truly worship God? A new heart. What is the foremost offering God asks of us to bring to him? Like David confesses in in Psalm 51, a broken and contrite heart. What is saving faith? To believe with the heart, right? Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he has risen from the dead and you shall be saved. Where, does, where ought Christ to dwell in your life? As Paul prays in Ephesians 3.17, to dwell richly in our hearts by faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it answers this question. How should we love one another? Fervently from the heart. What should we be watching over and guarding with all diligence according to Proverbs 4.23 and Hebrews chapter 3 verse 12 so that there not be an evil heart of unbelief arising or in our hearts? It should be there, our hearts. We should be watching it, guarding it with all diligence. Amen? Let's stand. Let me go ahead and close in prayer because of our time so that we can exit. You heard the message, and so ask the Lord to search your heart. But if you know clearly that you have not, that you don't have a new heart, meaning you haven't been born again, you have not repented of your sins as a sinner, and have put all your trust in Jesus as your only Savior, it's only His sacrifice that you could be saved by. And be forgiven of all your sins. And it's only by his righteousness, as we sung it this morning with solid rock, we can only stand faultless before the throne of God because we are standing on the solid rock of the righteousness of Christ. And this can be the morning of your salvation. But if not, then your heart is far away from the Lord. And therefore, the Lord will not accept your religious deeds, even of this morning. You can try to honor him with your lips, but if your heart is far away from him, then your worship is unacceptable. Your heart is still corrupt and lost and in darkness. So please see me, see any of us here, if that's a decision, or even as a professing Christian, a member of our church, if you've been living in sin, if you've been indulging the sinful desires of your heart, then repent of it. Confess it and keep on trusting Christ for the payment of your sins. Paul prays, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, and the height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that we can ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Remember to promptly just move.